And uh, let's just go on to the uh, next sutta. This is this is the Sambodhi Sutta, the Sutta on Awakening. And found in the numerical discourses, the chapter on nine is the very first sutta. And uh, so this is a little bit more about a number of factors on the path. And perception is only a small part of this. Uh, and so we'll have a look at how many factors come together in a sense. Uh, this is also called, uh, this sutta has another name somewhere else. What is it called again? Uh, um, can't remember it. It's called some. It's not called country member. It's called something. <laughs> it has a <laughs> has a different name. So here we go. So I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove at Pindika's monastery. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, if wanderers who follow other paths were to ask. Reverence, what is the vital condition for the development of the awakening factors? How would you answer them? Yeah, so this is kind of a very common theme in the suttas. You have the wanderers of other paths, of other religions, if you like, and they often have conversation with the Buddhist monks, or they have conversation with the Buddha himself, and then they will have a discussion, yeah, and they would... Uh, uh, so and often they will ask the Buddha about the, the Dhamma, and sometimes the Buddha will ask questions in return. So, so what is the vital condition for the development of the awakening factors? This is very interesting. The awakening factors are the Satta Sambhojanga, and these are the things that actually lead to awakening. That is why they're called awakening factors. They're not called awakening factors for some other reason. For example, that they partake of awakening? No, it's because they lead to awakening that they actually are called this. And so what is the vital condition, the upanisa, for, the, for these uh, awakening factors? Yeah, it's a very, very useful question. Now, to give you some idea what the awakening factors are, there are seven of them, Satta Sambhojanga. The first one is called the Sati Sambhojanga. That is the awakening factor of mindfulness. Yeah. And so this is equivalent, roughly, to the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Sati, basically the same thing. Yeah. And then it goes from the Sati Sambhojanga, you then have the awakening factor of investigation of uh, Dhammas, investigation of qualities. Then you have the energy awakening factor, you have the piti, the rapture, or the joy awakening factor. Then you have the tranquility awakening factor, then you have the samadhi or stillness awakening factor, and we have the equ equanimity awakening factor. Yeah, so seven, it ends with equanimity. And equanimity is like uh, the highest stage of samadhi, like the fourth jhana, whatever. So these uh, seven factors of awakening are basically an expansion of the last two factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? They begin with sati sambhojanga, and they end with upeka sambhojanga. So they constitute that uh, last two factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, in detail, if you wish. So this is kind of interesting. Yeah? This kind of has to do with the very culmination of the practice. So what are the vital conditions that lead to this? This is all about meditation, really. Yeah? Starting with mindfulness, ending with samadhi. So in a sense, you could say, what are the vital conditions for meditation practice? Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? So it means that if you practice these vital conditions, next year when you come back, are you coming back next year? Yeah. yeah, okay. So you are. Okay, good. Just checking. So if you're coming back, so that means that you have now a chance, one year, to put in place the vital conditions, right? Uh, so work on those vital conditions, and then next year we come back, we try again. And then uh, go also, you know, whenever you do some meditation, you will find out whether it works or not. Uh, this is more like a teaching retreat than a meditation retreat, but uh, you have some, you get some idea. So let's have a look at what's, what they are. How would you answer? And then they replied to the Buddha, our teachings are rooted in the Buddha. The mendicants will listen and remember it. So when the Buddha says, what would you say? The mendicants say, please, we, please, sir, please tell us. And that's what they usually answer him. Well, then, mendicants, listen and pay close attention. I will speak. Yeah, it's again this idea that the Dhamma is a vital concern. The Dhamma is about the meaning of life. Listen, for goodness sake. Now you're going to hear something really interesting here. Yeah? Yeah, so is that what you're doing as well? So listen. Okay, listen. Shh. Wow. 
Jesus. <laughs> yes, they replied, the Buddha said this. Uh, Mendicants, if a wanderer should follow other paths, were to ask, reverence, what is the vital condition for the development of the awakening factors? You should answer them. Uh, it is when a mendicant has good friends, uh, good companions, and good associates. Uh, this is the first vital condition for the development of the awakening factors. Uh, this is the Kalyana Mitta, yeah, the Kalyana Sampai, Sampayika or something like that. Uh, so, Kalyanamittas, yeah, this is the first vital condition for the awakening factors. Uh, and in fact, this idea of Kalyanamitta, of good spiritual friends, uh, is uh, in many places in the suttas, is the very beginning of the spiritual life. It starts with that. Uh, that is the cause for everything else to happen. Uh, yeah, so this is incredibly important. Without that spiritual friendship, uh, actually, there is no development of the path at all. Uh, we are completely lost. That is why the arising of the Buddha in the world is so, is so important, because the Buddha is the first person who sees the world rightly. He then becomes the Kalyanamitta for everyone else. And that means that your number one Kalyanamitta is the Buddha. Yeah, this is the one, number one Kalyanamitta. And this is why we are reading the suttas. This is why it is the job of a monastic to explain the suttas to myself, first of all, but also to everyone else, because this is the foundation for the spiritual life. So your number one Kalyanamitta is the Buddha. And then, of course, all the Kalyanamittas will be uh, very important. Is the noble Sangha, the Arya Sangha is very important. Uh, so whatever there are noble people in the world, uh, they are very important because they understand directly from experience what uh, uh, the Dhamma is. Uh, then there is the Sangha more broadly. Uh, and then there is all the people, yeah, all the Buddhists in your life who are there around you and who support you in the practice. All of these are your Kalyanamittas. But especially the noble people in the world are the Kalyanamittas, those who understand the Dhamma through personal experience. Yeah, so this is incredibly important. And what this means is that if you want this path to work, you have to come back to those Kalyanamittas regularly, yeah, regular times. And uh, there is this beautiful simile that I talk about a lot, but I think it's really worthwhile maybe just mentioning it again to make it clear to you how powerful this actually is. And this is a sutta in the Anguttara Tens called the uh, Avijja Sutta. And according to that sutta, it starts off by saying that uh, yeah, yeah, the practice of the path, it begins first of all with the Sapurisa Sangseva. What does that mean? It means hanging out with the superior people. To make sure you hang out with superior people. And by hanging out, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be a very kind of formal situation. Yeah, It can be really relaxed and hanging out. Because very often when you hang out with people who are superior, sapurisa, these are the areas, this is the Buddha, the noble ones. Sometimes it's almost like osmosis. You see how they live, you see how they act, you see what they're like, and you draw in some of that energy, some of that understanding, simply by seeing them in action. And this is kind of very beautiful. Yeah? So hanging out or associating is a more formal way of saying the same thing. Yeah? Associating with the noble people. This is the first condition to make the path work. Yeah? This is the foundation of everything. Yeah? Then because you hang out with the noble people, you get to hear the good Dhamma. When you hear the good Dhamma, you get faith. When you have faith, you have Yoni Somanasikara, wise attention. When you have wise attention, you have Sense mindfulness and clear comprehension. When you have mindfulness and clear comprehension, you have sense restraint. When you have sense restraint, you fulfill the three kinds of good conduct, body, speech, and mind. When you fulfill the three kinds of good conduct, you have you get the uh, mindfulness meditation, satipatthanas. When you have the satipatthanas, you get the awakening factors, which is what we're talking about now. When you get the awakening factors, from that comes the vidya vimutti, liberation and knowledge. That's a beautiful sequence. Yeah, one thing leading to the next one. But it starts with the hanging out with the noble people and it ends with liberation and, uh, and knowledge or insight. Yeah, but it is the bottom one which actually everything starts out with. And then the Buddha has this beautiful simile to explain how this works. And he says that it is when, and you have heard this before, but I will say it again. Please don't get bored. <laughs> When it rains on the mountaintop, yeah, it rains and rains on the mountaintop, uh, the water 
come falls down the uh, come out streams down the mountain top, uh, and it forms into little streams. Uh, and if it keeps on raining on that mountain top, those little streams become bigger and bigger, and they merge into larger streams. Uh, and if it keeps on raining on that mountain top, those little streams eventually they go into lit little lakes. Uh, and if it keeps on raining on that mountain top, uh, eventually those little lakes they fill up. Uh, if it keeps on raining on the mountaintop, you notice the raining on the mountaintop is the critical thing. If it stops raining, this is not going to work. So the rain keeps coming on the mountaintop. Eventually, the little lakes flow over and they go into the rivers and they become rivers. Then if it keeps on raining on the mountaintop, those rivers, they go into the large lakes. Eventually, if it keeps on raining on the mountaintop, those large lakes become full. They overflow. And if it keeps on raining on that mountaintop, uh, the large lakes overflow into the large rivers, like the Ganges River. Uh, and if it keeps on raining on the mountaintop, eventually those large rivers uh, go into the sea. Uh, but for those large rivers to re reach the sea, it is absolutely necessary that the rain keeps coming on that mountaintop. Uh, what is the rain on the mountaintop? Uh, it is hanging out with the noble ones. Uh, that is the rain, yeah? It is the first factor on this path. And it goes from the first one all the way through, eventually reaching the Vijjavimutti, reaching the insight and liberation. The only thing that matters is that it keeps raining on that mountaintop. And it sounds too good to be true. How can it be so simple? Yeah. And the answer is that because when you hear this Dhamma, the Dhamma is so compelling. It makes you act. It makes you live in a certain way. Basically, you get brainwashed. Yeah, and usually in life we are brainwashed by stupid things. Uh, actually, we are brain dirtied. That's a new. I just coined that term, so please remember where it came from. Brain dirtying. Yeah, yeah? <laughs> it's a new word just arising in the world. You get brain dirtied, but instead of getting brain dirtied, go to brainwashing instead. Uh, yeah, clean out the brain, uh. and then as you, the only thing that you have to do is come back to these teachings again and again and again. Uh. And then eventually that will lead you all the way to the ocean in this way. And this gives you an idea of how important it is to associate with the right kind of friends. Yeah, How important it is to associate with the Buddha, with the superior people, with all of these people that support you in your practice. It is actually founda so foundational for the whole process to actually take place. So remember the simile of the rain on the mountaintop. Yeah? The rain is the hanging out, the association. The uh, uh, osmosis factor of, of uh, being with uh, people who are superior. The first vital condition for awakening to happen here. Uh. Sometimes I just feel like, no, anyway. <laughs> Some of these the things are so nice, you don't really want to carry on afterwards. You just want to stop there and just uh, let it be the rest of the day. Anyway, that's What's going to happen, so might as well carry on. <laughs> okay, let's go to the second one. Furthermore, a mendicant is ethical, restrained in the monastic code. Yeah, this is the Patimoka, conducting themselves well and seeking alms in suitable places. Seeing dangers in the slightest fault, they keep the rules that they have undertaken. This is the second vital condition for developing the awakening factors. So, this is. Uh, for a lay person, this just means that you take on the precepts, yeah, and you live in kindness in the world. Uh, you live with care, you live with compassion, you live with understanding. Yeah? You live in a way that is uh, maximizing your uh, uh, your ethical conduct. Yeah. So this is the monastic way, and the, your, you have your own ways. It's kind of just uh, variations of the theme. Uh, seeing danger in the slightest fault. Yeah. This is a very kind of interesting and powerful thing. Yeah? Because any kind of fault you have uh, will make you go backwards on the path. Uh. So I'm not going to dwell on that much more. Let's, let's just move forward. Uh. Furthermore, a mendicant gets to take part in talk about self-effacement uh, that helps open the heart uh, uh, when they want uh, without trouble and difficulty. Uh. So, um, opening of the heart, this is the Cheta Sobhivadana. This is like the opposite of the Nivadana. So, again, it's the freedom from defilements of the heart or the mind. 
And self-effacement is about the idea that we are, in a sense, we are reducing the sense of self in Buddhism. Yeah, we're kind of gradually, um, gradually becoming less self-centered or self uh, self-important. Uh, and so you allow the sense of self to gradually wear away. Uh, yeah, and you gain talk that leads to these things. Uh, yeah, without trouble and difficulty. Uh, again, this requires hanging out with the noble ones. Yeah hanging out with those people where you have a chance to get to hear these teachings. Uh, teachings teach that inspire you. Teachings that make you want to live a pure life. Uh, teachings where you feel that your faith is increasing. Uh, teachings where you feel that you actually your mind is becoming more pure because you are thinking in the right way. Uh, when you are really contemplating the Dhamma properly and fully, uh, you start to feel the purification process within because you're focusing on something which is counter to all the defilements of the world. The Dhamma goes in the opposite direction. This is the beauty of the Dhamma. And when you listen to the Dhamma fully and in the right way, you actually can feel that there is a purification going on. We will see this later on when we come to these other parts of the suttas. Yeah, for those, who, if you're staying on for the next few days, we will see exactly how this works. At full Confidence and listening to the Dhamma actually leads to an overcoming of the defilements. So. so we should often have this kind of talk, yeah, that leads to this. Uh, not talk that leads in the opposite direction. Talk that leads to desires, uh, to attachments, uh, to, all, to all of these kind of things. Uh, and there's too much of that kind of talk going on in the world, yeah. So sometimes we have to insulate ourselves a little bit from the other kind of talk. We need to hang out. This is why it is so important again, to hang out with the right kind of people so we get the right kind of talk. You will notice here that it is not so much talk about technical things. It is not so much talk about uh, uh, you know, the details of dependent origination. It is more talk that is inspiring and uplifting and brightening of the mind. That is really the significant talk because that is what then leads to the meditation, which is exactly what this is about, leading to the seven factors of awakening here. So, uh, hanging out with the Sapurisa, the, the Kalanamitas, uh, um, virtue, uh, and then uh, listening to talk, that is, uh, leads in the same direction. Uh. So here, are, here is the talk. So, okay, I forgot about that. So here is, here is the actual talk. The talk about fewness of wishes, uh, about contentment, uh, about seclusion, uh, about aloofness, uh, about arousing energy, about ethics, about samadhi, about wisdom, about freedom, and about the knowledge and vision of freedom. Uh, so this is the kind of talk it's quite rare to hear this kind of talk in the world. Huh? So anyway, this is the third vital condition for the development of the awakening factors. Further, a mendicant lives with the energy roused up for giving up unskillful qualities and embracing skillful qualities. They are strong, staunchly vigorous, not slacking off when it comes to developing skillful qualities. Yeah, so you have this energy, this desire to give up what is unwholesome and to build up what is wholesome. You want this because you understand the urgency with this. Now is the time. Your hair is on fire, as it says in the suttas. And when your hair is on fire, you don't think, yeah, whatever. You think, let me do something. Let me put it out. Because if your hair is on fire, you are in serious trouble. So you do something very much straight away to put it out. And you arouse this kind of energy. This is the idea here, here. This is the fourth vital condition for the development of the awakening factors. Uh, you understand the urgency that is uh, uh, at stake. Yeah. Furthermore, a mendicant is wise. They have wisdom of the arising and passing away, which is noble, penetrative, and leads to the complete ending of suffering. Yeah. This is the fifth vital condition uh, for the development of the awakening factors. Uh, the wisdom of arising and passing away. Yeah, so this is uh, seeing the arising and passing away of all phenomena in the world. Uh, so this is like basically an alternative way of talking about the idea of impermanence. Uh, impermanence means, but this gives you a deeper sense of impermanence. Uh, sometimes this is called the wisdom of rising and falling. Uh, but rising and falling is wrong. Uh, 
It is not about rising and falling. Rising and falling means it's like on the ocean you have waves. They rise and they fall, but the ocean is always there. Now, this is not about the ocean always being there. This is about uh, things coming into existence from nothing and then disappearing back to nothingness again. Yeah, so arising and passing away is the appropriate translation, not rise and fall. Rise and fall gives a misleading idea what this is about. And it is noble and penetrative in the sense that it, uh, it makes you into a noble person. Uh, and it, you penetrate into the truth, into the reality of things. Uh, and it leads on to the complete ending of suffering. Uh, yeah, seeing, uh, rising and passing away. It's strange, isn't it? Rising and passing away leads to the ending of suffering. Uh, it shows you how impermanence and suffering are so closely connected to each other. A mendicant with good friends and good companions and associates can be expected to be ethical. Yeah? If you have good friends, uh, you will be kind. You will be a kind person. Uh, a person who has good friends can be expected to get part in talk that is self-effacing and opens up the heart. Because when you hang out with the sapurisas, the kalamitas, you, can, you get to hear this kind of talk, yeah. A man that can be good friends can be expected to have your energy roused up because you understand the importance of getting on with the practice. You understand the urgency, and so you get on with it. A man that can be good friends and associates can be expected to be wise. Yeah, the wisdom arises from that energy because you are dwelling in meditation and you see things arising and coming, uh, arising and passing away, and so then you, uh, this is what happens as a consequence. Uh, but then a mendicant grounded on these five things should develop four further things. They should develop the perception of ugliness to give up greed. So I guess greed here, this is a slightly different way of thinking about it. I guess attachment might be a more natural way of thinking about it. Desire and attachment, yeah. So uh, you, the perception of ugliness may be in a very broad sense here. We should develop love to give up hate. So we should develop the perception of uh, non-ill will, yeah? the perception of uh, the good qualities in people. Uh, Ajahn Brahm often talks about developing the Subha Sanya. The Subha Sanya is the uh, perception of beauty, especially in other people. Uh, this is how you develop metta for other people when you see the good qualities in them. Uh, so this is how you develop ill will. So first of all, you, do, you abandon greed, then you do van, abandon hate. Yeah? The next one you develop is that you develop mindfulness of breathing to cut off thinking. Yeah? You can see that there is a system here. Yeah? The system is abandon the defilements, uh, first of all, then abandon the thinking through mindfulness of breathing. And then finally, they should develop the perception of impermanence to uproot the conceit, I am. So... Uh, there's a natural progression going on here, based on the Kalanamitta, and then this progression in the meditation practice comes after that. Uh, when you perceive impermanence, uh, the perception of non-self becomes stabilized. Uh, perceiving not-self, you uproot the conceit, I am, and attain extinguishment in this very life. So, um, that is uh, this uh, little sutta, and it uh, shows you the path again. The path can be expressed in so many different ways, uh, and this is a very nice way of thinking about the path. Uh, so starting off with Kalanamitta, what is that? Well, that is like right view. Yeah? So you start off with that right view, and then you abandon, through the meditation, you abandon uh, the <laughs> desire and attachment. This is called called here, it was called uh, greed, and that is an aspect of uh, a virtue. Then you uh, practice love or friendliness, if you like, to abandon hate. Another aspect of virtue, so you have, first of all, you have right view, then the virtues come in, and then comes meditation, you practice the mindfulness of breathing, right? And when you practice the mindfulness of breathing, then the samasati meditation comes, and finally, based on that samasati, which leads to samasamadhi, you then get the insights at the end of the path, uh, which is perceiving non-self. Uh, 
So you can see kind of the noble at full path is there, yeah, but with a different angle on it uh, from what you normally see. And this is one of the uh, brilliant things about the suttas is that you see kind of the same training, the same practice on different angles, uh, yeah, coming uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh. So uh, let's stop there. Huh? And let's have a tea break, yeah, and uh, we'll see you back again at uh, 4.30. Yeah. Okay.